Um, the, uh, we've got some really interesting presentations today and uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll uh, you all agree and we sort of kick off with uh, uh, Bushy and uh, um, uh, who's doing a, a presentation on uh, uh, the evolution of the amateur dusky flathead fishery. Now Bushy probably doesn't need a lot of introduction to uh, most people that have been around the wreck fishing sector for uh, for a while. He's uh, a media personality but also uh, um, yeah, a lure developer, but but also really, I've, I've had the pleasure of being on the boat a couple of times with uh, uh, with Bushy, and he's uh, uh, an incredibly uh, gifted fisherman. And uh, if you fish beside him, you know you, you you it's it's actually nice to catch the odd fish uh, compared to the uh, the numbers. He has this sort of saying, you know, like oh, look, something stuck on the end of my line, and he says that a lot. Um, but. Uh, um, yeah, like I just uh, like to, to welcome Bushy, uh, give him a really great welcome, and uh, I know it's a great presentation. Thanks very much, Craig. That's a, a good introduction that you've come up with there. I think I might have caught a couple, but uh, I'm sure Craig acquitted himself pretty well. Uh, it's great to see you all here today, and I really do um, appreciate the opportunity to come here and have a yak. Not that it, uh, I'm ever short of a word talking about fishing, but um, this is a great opportunity to talk about something that I really do love doing, especially the dusky flathead. And uh, being a local Victorian guy born in, um, in Bairnsdale a long time ago, uh, which sometimes isn't good, but it is good in some ways because at least I've seen the dusky flathead fishery from you know, a, a, pretty, a lot of years, put it that way. I've been around a long time and I've seen where it started and I've, I know where it's come from or where it's got to now. Um, now, attitudes have changed a lot. What I am going to talk about is the changes in, uh, in the dusky flathead fishery, both attitudinally with anglers and also with uh, tackle, tactics, all those sorts of things. And this is where we were, I think that's about 30 years ago that, that photo was taken. And in those days, that was what happened. If you got lucky, like my mate did, and I did there, um, that one I'm holding was 13 and a half pound. I couldn't tell you how long it was because in those days, you killed it stone dead, hung it on the wall, you knew how much it weighed and then you went and ate it. Um, uh, I suppose I don't really apologise for doing what we did in those days, but I regret that we were so dumb that we did it. Um, we just didn't realise that we could out overfish areas. We just did not realise. We were too dumb. That's, that's the facts. We just thought, all right, there's a lake, it's full of dusky flattered. If you go and wang a few, it doesn't matter if they're big, small, indifferent. We had no bag limits, we had nothing. Um, and that's what we did, and that's what everyone else did too, if you got lucky. Um, having said that, I can still remember that, that day. I was actually a commercial fisherman uh, in those days, and we'd already been out on the continental shelf uh, catching blue-eyed Travella, so we were up at three in the morning, and we'd uh, went and done our thing, got our catch of blue-eyed Travella, dropped lining on the edge of the shelf, come back home, boxed all the fish up, send them away to market. So by then it's about two in the afternoon, so what do you do? You jump in the little tinny, grab your lures and go dusky flatty fishing up the back of the lake. Pretty big day, but that's what we did. Anyway, um, my mate who's on the, the uh, left hand side over there with the nine and a half, the little nine and a half pounder, he's heaved his lure in the water and clunk, got the great big flatty. And he says, geez Bushy, we haven't got a landing there any. I've never had one this big, you better grab it. I said, hang on a minute, those things have got bloody great spikes on them, you, you mean just grab it? And he said, well, it's the biggest one I've ever got, you're going to have to grab it. So anyway, I said, right on, if it has to be done. So in the end, I've grabbed this thing by the middle and squeaked a couple of times and let it go and finally dumped it in the boat. And then I, I think my exact words were, gee, you're a tinny bugger. I said, how come you get all the big duskies? And I went, wang, threw it out, next cast, bang, 13 and a half pounder on the end. So... I've got that up to the boat and I said, well, mate, we've got no landing net still. You're going to have to grab that. And he said, bullshit. He said, that's got great big spikes on it. And he would not grab it. Anyway, so um, look, duskies are a pretty special fish. I think a lot of people like to catch them. And the fact that you can catch a really big special fish in our estuaries is, is a great thing. Um, and now, at least, we've got really great regulations. We are doing something about changing the way we think. That's the biggest thing. I'm the same person I was then, I'm a bit older, but there's no way in the wide world I'd kill something like that now, I just wouldn't even think about it. And the good news is that when you get to that stage and you know that you shouldn't be killing something like that and it should be put back there to breed, it's not that you can't eat something like that, well you probably can, but do you need to? No, we don't need to. 
you leave it there for someone else to catch if they have a, and they're going to have as great a time as you. They can release it, um, and we can eat the other slot limit type fish, and it's all going to work pretty well. So anyway, that's where we used to be. Uh, and when we first started, it was pretty much a bait fishery. Um, everyone used bait. Everyone went away and just wanted to catch a feed of fish, kill whatever was there. Not to, to be a bad person, we just did not realise that we had enough population to destroy a fishery. So anyway, I'm the same person as I was then, but a little bit of education, and I operate completely differently. Um, and I'm sure that now, well I know now, from being heavily involved in the industry, that, um, oh Rexy, I must admit, Wayne, I didn't ever kiss any of the fish, so don't be alarmed. I was next to the fish kisser, and look, he did do a, a pretty good thing, oh Rexy, with... Uh, with um, getting that fish kissing thing going because without it, we probably would have a hell of a lot less fish than we do now. Um, and one of the things, uh, especially for Wayne to, to know, is I can tell you one quick little story. Uh, our aquarium in Marimbula burnt down at one stage and all the fish died. Uh, and I knew the guy who owned it and he said, look, Bushy, if you could give us a hand and go and catch a few fish so, so that we can start restocking the aquarium, we need stuff that you can catch stuff like dusky flathead, brim, trevally, uh, blackfish, those kinds of things. You reckon you could catch a, a few to put back in the aquarium and get us started again because they had no fish at all uh, for their tourism. So anyway, I didn't have anything sophisticated. All I had was a big, a big um, black drum that they gave me that I put in my little tinny uh, and I went into a marimbula lake and over a period of uh, probably a week and a half, I think I caught them about 35 uh, fish of different species, all those ones I mentioned, flathead, trevally, whatever. No special treatment, all I did was have barbless hooks, caught them on standard lure technology, put them in the black, the black uh, container and took them a few at a time back into the aquarium. Uh, and you would think those fish were pretty stressed out, they're put in an unnatural environment and then t they're taken back into an even more unnatural environment in an aquarium. And after three months, every single fish was still alive. Now. In that aquarium, they have normal mortality anyway. Fish die here and there through the process. So that was pretty amazing, and, and I must admit it did surprise me. Okay, I know when other people are releasing fish and holding them out of the water too long and giving them a hard time, you're going to have some mortality. But I can tell you that's a true story. The whole 35 fish lived. So maybe that's not quite as bad as what you're, what you're imagining with some of that stuff. So look, it's, it's not the be all and end all to release fish, but it's certainly a valuable tool. Okay, we better, we, can we go on to the next, um, next shot we got here? Okay, after the bait, the bait sort of fishing uh, thing that started all the dusky flathead fishing, some idiot came along and popularised soft plastics. I certainly didn't invent them. Um, I had a trip to America and I noticed that in these big Bass Pro shops, probably half the shop was devoted to soft plastic lures and I thought, Geez, it's a bit different to what we've got in Australia. We've only got really Mr. Twisters and stuff like that with great big fat, pretty blunt hooks and they do work well. Maybe I can do a bit better here. So came back to Australia and, and started to look at uh, modifying and changing some of the lures that I, I knew we could buy in America uh, and probably got a bit lucky being involved with a guy called John Dunphy who worked for um, the Shimano Tackle Company. So he looked at what I was doing. Now Dunphy's a pretty successful guy and I'm just a dumb fisherman, so Dump's sort of looking at the things I'm cutting up and gluing together, and he said, what are you doing there, Bushy? You know, and I said, oh, I'm just changing these lures around because there's no good ones in Australia, and I'm catching a few of these, John, and a bit of that, and he said, oh, right. He said, okay, he said, you're going to China next week. He said, don't come back till we've got a range of bloody plastics, and I've gone, holy hell. But Dump lives in a $6 million house, and I'm living in a shack, you know, so I thought, well, maybe he knows what he's talking about. So anyway, we got, we got this soft plastic thing started, and... Uh, for Dusky Flattered especially, it was a real eye-opener. Um, again, a little bit of a double-edged sword because um, once when we were using bait, uh, I guess we picked off a lot of the fish were, that were around the shores and in the shallower water. Um, and again, we went to hard-bodied lures, uh, probably in the beginning. Most of them were shallow running lures, so you're running lures and fishing where flathead like to lie in the shallows. So we picked a lot of those ones off, but the reserves were still out in the middle of the lake. And in some ways, um, it was a bad thing, I guess, because the lead head that's on the front of that lure, we could vary that weight. Uh, and that was one of the, the good things about that system, I suppose. We can have heavier heads and lighter heads on the same plastic lure. That just means you can fish all the shallows, but also, when you got sick of fishing the shallows, we could go out the whole lake 
uh, was now open to us. So in some ways that was a bad thing because it just meant we could eliminate all the reserves uh, that in the past were slaying out there and then would come in and we'd be able to catch them in the shallows. Once this got going, uh, and you combine that with the increase in better tackle where we had braided lines, lighter rods, it was open slather on the flatties. And uh, we certainly, you know, as a group, took too many. Uh, I've got no doubt about that. Um, but it was certainly a very significant way to catch flathead and, and still is. It's a very deadly way to do it. Um, a lot of fun, but with it uh, has come a bit of responsibility that we do have to work out how to limit our catch. And that's where the Vic Fisheries has come in really well with their good slot limit regulations, which I think are absolutely excellent. Um, all right, we'll try the next shot and see where we go. Uh, there's other ways to catch the flathead too. Now that's a, a vibrating lure, commonly known as a vibe if you're not so much into the fishing. Um, you've got your attachment point about in the middle. So when you, when you lift that lure, it vibrates really hard. Absolutely diabolically deadly on, on dusky flathead. So, and basically easy to fish. All you're doing is throwing that lure out, letting it get to the bottom, lift your rod, it's a quick vibration, you drop it back down to the bottom and next time you go to lift it, it'll be stuck. And more often than not, it'll be stuck in the mouth of a flathead. So that's uh, another form of uh, sort of fishing that evolved. Um, a lot of the brim tournaments probably helped that along. Uh, not a new lure, I mean that's one I, I sort of made for Australia, but uh, been around since the 50s. Um, I think the Sonic was about the first one that the Yanks made for catching largemouth bass. But again, it's a, another way to catch uh, dusky flathead and a very effective way at, at that. Um, probably, oh, yeah, we'll go, go the next, next shot then. Um, apart from fishing with the vibes um, and fishing with hard-bodied lures and fishing with bait, one of the newer ways to do it is fly fishing. Uh, that's, that's a guy I'll probably get killed for putting his photo up there. He's Mr. Secret. That's a bloke called Dave Long and who's an absolute gun on the fly fishing scene. Dave can catch anything on a fly and he really loves to get out in these areas that, that we have and, um, and fish for the duskies on the fly rod. And that's probably one of the later things that, that people are now doing. But it's a terrific way to fish. It's, uh, it's a very relaxing method of fishing. Uh, probably not as deadly as the plastics and the other things, which in another way is probably a good thing uh, because you can have a lot of fun. You can be out there involved in the environment and you're fishing, not necessarily catching thousands of them, but you're having a, a good time and it's certainly deadly enough that you can catch some, some really special fish. Um, and again, Dave releases probably 90% of what he catches. He might keep a few smaller ones to eat, but he's letting them go. So that's uh, a fly fishing. So what have we got for the next one? We'll kick on to that one. Um, that was a fish that I caught um, not too long ago. Actually, I was I was trying to catch a feeder fish. Actually, not not trying to catch a big flathead, but that big one just happened to get on the end. Uh, I was nearly nearly a metre, not quite high nineties. Um, I was by myself when I caught it. Hence, I haven't got a great big glowing shot to show you. But um, that was him lying in the in the bottom of the boat. Uh, again, didn't stay in the bottom of the boat too long. Put it back in the water quite quickly. We go on to the next shot on there. Uh, all right, yeah, I, I've probably got a bit out of line there, but anyway, uh, th that big fish was just caught uh, on a hard body lure in the shallow water, fishing for a smaller one. Big ones come along. Pretty special day when you catch something that size. Uh, and again, that was straight out of the boat, straight back in the water in the net till it came good, and I did let it go. Um, I think that's that's the way most people now are operating on those big fish and they probably were even before we put the slot limit in place. Uh, most of the guys were already lined up for letting those big, bigger breeding fish go. Um, I mean, there's a bit of conjecture lately. There's been some science coming out to suggest that maybe the, the biggest fish don't always have the best eggs. I think that's probably a little bit dangerous because I, I'm suggesting that we still should be letting the big, the big fish go. Uh, I'm a bit with Wayne, no good eating those tough ones. I reckon you might as well leave them in there anyway. Uh, and it's just a good thing. I don't think, um, even if maybe the eggs aren't quite as viable in some of the largest ones, I still think there's going to be plenty of good eggs in most of them. And some, you know, there's variations in fish. Some great big fish are going to be super healthy and have good eggs. I think it'd be a shame to go backwards and, and you know, start taking them. I think it's a fantastic thing that if a dusky lives big enough, well, it's going to, it's going to pretty well stay there to breed. Um, the reason I put that, that shot in there, 
If you look at my wading boots, uh, that's a little bit different form of fishing. That was on a surface lure. We're now catching um, quite a lot of flathead on the surface, which some people haven't caught up with yet. Uh, we're just using lures specifically designed to chug along the surface and we're walking to catch them. So that was uh, walking on the sand flats and that's a beautiful way to enjoy, enjoy the environment and get out there and just go for a walk. Nice hot sunny day, you're walking around in knee deep water and when one of these big fish comes and belts your surface lure off the top, it's not something people associate with flathead doing but they certainly do it and to see something that size cartwheel out and eat your lure is, is a very exciting way to, to, to be involved in the environment, it's, it's fantastic. Um, okay, we'll shoot on to the next one. Um, right, that, that fish was probably one of the bigger ones that I've ever caught. Again, I, I didn't measure or weigh that one. That went, that went straight back. Um, so, yeah, that, that fish was caught in Malacuta. Uh, again, a little bit of a funny story. I, I, um, I had a couple of rods rigged in the boat, fishing with soft plastics. So I've heaved in, got a, got a flatty about three pound on the end. So I'm winding him in and it got right to the boat, probably to where the front row of chairs is. And that big one's come straight up and grabbed the three pounder straight by the middle. So I've got hold of one rod with a three pound flathead on it and then a giant one hanging on the three pounder and I'm going, bloody hell, how can I get this thing? So anyway, I've thought now, if I grab the other rod that's sitting there, it's already got a lure on it, I'll hang on to that. If I pull hard enough, maybe you'll let that one go and I'll throw that one in and that'll work. And it did work, exactly what happened. <laughs> grab this one, he let that one go and I went flonk and he's grabbed it. So then I've got two flathead on two rods <laughs> and one's that size. So uh, I, I, I think I flicked the three pound one into the boat and I fought that one and got him in. And I just was, I can give away the spot there, I was about 50 metres from the jetty at Cape Horn and there was a couple of people fishing there with a couple of rods off that jetty. So I, I flew over there, it took about a minute to go over there and I said, mate, can you take a picture for me? And I grabbed the flathead, he took the picture with my camera and he's just sort of eyes are about this big and he took the picture and then I just put it in the water and it swam straight away and then he really bugged out his eyes. And he, He's sort of looking as though, did that really happen? You know, so look, things like that can happen. And, and again, I can tell you, um, the fishing that we have here in Victoria, it it's doesn't take second place to, to other, other areas. I, I know when I was a kid, uh, I used to read every uh, American fishing magazine about the largemouth bass and all the rest of the stuff. And I'm thinking, oh, geez, I wish I lived in America. I could be using hard body lures and I could be using surface lures. And I could be using all these vibes. Yeah, except it was all around me, everywhere. Uh, and the Gippsland Lakes, when I was a kid, you know, 50 years ago, was pretty damn good. Don't worry about that. Uh, the fishing is definitely coming back now, and, and it's going to be good again. But um, what we had there, all those things were available to me. Brim ate all those lures. Dusky Flathead ate all those lures, just that we didn't know about it, so no one did it. Uh, and now we've got all that um, knowledge behind us that we can really take advantage of the fishing. It's fantastic. Uh, all right, hit us up with another shot. What do we got? All right, that's that's what happens these days, uh, which I think is is a great thing. As soon as someone catches a decent fish, you wet the brag mat, brag mat, put your fish on there, and that was this was a real deal. I was actually fishing with one of my mates, and he's an old guy, he's even older than I am, if that's possible. Uh, so he's caught a decent flatty. First thing he says is, right, grab the brag mat, put a bit of water on it. Can you take a photo of this? I want to show my son. So it goes on the brag mat, I take the photo with my phone, the fish is back in the water in about 30 seconds flat, he's as happy as hell, I go, here, here's your shot. Um, he said, right, I can show him his son, he know I won't be a bullshitter, she'll be fine. But you can get all the glory you want, you can have all the fun you want, and that fish, I can guarantee you that fish is going to be completely healthy. Um, and while we're on that little, little caper of letting some go, I know you shouldn't probably play with your food, but... Um, letting some go is a really important tool for us uh, and I don't think it's any different to what Wayne's people used to do really. They had a slot limit long before we've come up with it. As Wayne said, you've got, you've got your tough fish that you didn't bother bringing in, you've got your fish that are too small and you've got the fish in the middle. Okay, you don't have to spear it and then let it go, that's a bit of a different story but we, if we catch something we don't know how big it's going to be. So we have to be able to let the small ones go as well as we can so we need catch and release for that. And I think we have to let the big tough ones go and we need to have good tools to be able to do that. But so far, I think we do have those tools. And one of the most important things that I've, I've come to realise, which is still not that widely practised, 
is that we need to use barbless hooks. I do not use a hook, well, it's probably a lie. I probably use 98% of my hooks that I ever use are barbless. And I think the first person that invented the fishing rod, as soon as we went from the hand line to the fishing rod, barbless hooks were obsolete. I have got absolutely no doubt that I can catch more fish on a barbless hook than I can on a barbed hook because that rod's bending and pulling the thing in. And then when you get the fish into the boat, guess what? You just grab it and go, it's straight out. You're not squeezing the hell out of it. You're not making its life hard. You're just unhooking it and letting it go. Uh, and it's something that's slipped past people, I think, so far. I think it is an absolutely huge thing to be using barbless hooks. Um, especially in things like brim tournaments, things like that. If you're not using a barbless hook, one, I reckon you're nuts because with a barbless hook, when I was in tournaments, I used barbless hooks because I knew I could catch more fish. You're just wasting less time getting rid of one fish and catching another one, and you're putting that fish back in the water in much better condition. So the barbless hook thing has got massive, massive miles in it, and we haven't you know, played that out yet properly. Um, and the reason I used barbed hooks for so long, guess what? It's because that ha that's how they come in the packet. I didn't think about it. I went, I'm going to buy a hook. Here's a hook. Here's how it comes. It's got a barb on it. Didn't think about too much else. Uh, and the only reason I really started using the barbless ones was when I was using vibes in a brim tournament. You want to catch as many fish as you can to keep the five big ones, and you want to let them all go. And I just figured out that it was a hell of a lot quicker to catch them on barbless hooks, and I wasn't losing any. In fact, I'm pretty sure... I was catching more because the barb only stops the hook going in anyway most of the time. And the other thing is that if you're, if you're like I am and a lot of other people doing a lot of fishing, you're going to hook yourself. I don't care who you are, you are going to hook yourself. Uh, I do a lot of whiting fishing on, on lures at the moment, not your King George's but your, your sand whiting. And I get hooked about four times a day because you grab the, the small ones and want to let them go, they twist around, the hook goes in your hand. Not a problem now, I just go, oh, hook's in my hand, <laughs> hook's not in my hand anymore. Barbless hooks, fantastic. Should be all using them. Uh, hit us up with the next shot and see how we go. Uh, what have we got now? Right, that was that, that big flathead that I, I showed you that was lying in the bottom of the boat. We've got rubber nets these days which don't damage the fish. So all I did was put him back in that rubber net. That's not me netting the fish, that's me releasing the fish. Just put him in the water, slide the net out of the front of him, swims away. I will guarantee you that fish is fine. Um, I'm not saying every fish you release is going to be, but I will guarantee you that that fish is, is no problem of still living. Um, I, mean, I, I think we've got the last one, have we? The last, last shot we can have a look at. Um, well, I guess that's, that's basically where it's at. Um, that little, little kid caught that, that flatty, and, you know, I think the look's still on its face. Um, they, they have a ball, and that's, the, that's what we should be doing. Um, Maybe I'm an old curmudgeon or whatever. I've been around a long time. I'm not real good with technology. I don't have my fed head stuck on my phone every minute of the day. But I think if you can get kids out fishing, which is what Vic Fisher is trying to do, that's a better way to, to be doing things if you, than, than sitting around with your phone stuck on your head. And, and let's face it, if you don't get kids hooked on this kind of thing, what else are they going to be doing? On the couch, sticking ice into their veins? That's no way to live a life. Um, Perhaps it's simplistic, but I just think if you get kids hooked on being out in the environment, doing good things, good positive things, and fishing's one of them. Uh, part of it certainly eating fish. I'm not, I'm not uh, a person who's advocating we let every single fish go. I love to have a feed of fish, and I think it's probably the main reason that I think we should be encouraging fishing is that you can go out there, eat some really good food that you've caught yourself. It's part of being in the world. I think we absolutely should be doing that. I, I'm, I don't think we should be ashamed to say we've killed something and eaten it. Um, I'm not real big on killing anything, and I think the only justification for killing a thing is to eat it. Um, but I think if kids are being involved in, in the environment, looking after, you know, being out there in the real world rather than doing the other things, I think we're on a big plus. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, that was the last photo that I've got there. I'm not too sure how much time I've, I've got left talking-wise. Anyone been keeping a count? How, where about? We're still going? How, how long have we got? Oh, I, I'm, I'm fine. I'll, I'll answer some questions if that's, if that's on the cards. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Do I which? Yeah, you've probably you've probably 
You've probably you've probably sustained one today. Yeah, flathead are particularly bad. I know Gus just probably was very callous and didn't warn you about all that stuff because he's a vicious man. But yes, if when you're releasing the flatties, um, and look, there is a bit to releasing fish too, which you know, so we've probably um, the fisheries have probably done stuff on releasing them. But obviously, you don't squeeze the hell out of them. One of the ways to hang on to the big flatties is put your thumb in its mouth. They've got fearsome long teeth. You're going to have you're going to have damage. You'll be able to sue though, it'll be all right. Gus got plenty of money. He's probably overpaid, he's on too many, you know, doing too much. He's always telling me he's doing too much work, so he's probably overpaid. Yeah, you do sustain the odd injury. Another question? Well, look, you probably could. That's that's one thing I, I probably didn't mention. The, the latest fad for catching flathead is to use very, very big wooden lures and, and very big plastics and wander them across, across the flat like Jewish-sized lures. So you're probably not that far off the mark. If you walk around the flats with some of your surface cod lures, you're probably going to get the hell frightened out of you the odd time. But the old pyramid of numbers thing, whereas there's more small ones than big ones, so if you've got a really big lure, you're not going to get as many bites. A lot of the flathead we get on the surface are when we're fishing for the sand whiting because now we're doing a lot of uh, popper fishing for sand whiting and that's mainly when these flatties come flying out of the water and, and belt your lure. But yeah, you're probably better using a some little bit smaller stuff than, than on the cod. But uh, it's right on the cards. That surface fishing's really good. And it's probably hard to cover a subject like this. As you've probably figured out, I'm not short of a word when it comes to talking about flatties. But it's hard to jam all of all of the stuff that I want to tell you into, into that one thing. So a couple of questions is probably good. If anyone else has got one that you might want to clarify, yep. Yeah, that's a really good question because uh, traditionally um, humans are a funny a funny crowd. Okay, they they do. Most of the time, they do the status quo. If George has got a hook with a barb on it, you buy a hook with a barb on it. And anything that's a bit different, humans won't do until it's kind of proven and it becomes the done thing and then they'll all do it. They're pretty much cheap humans, that's how it works. Um, so it's very difficult at the moment to buy barbless hooks anywhere normal. So I'm, re I'm reduced to making them, grinding the points off, uh, the barbs off some of them. The smaller ones you could just crush with a pair of pliers and it's much better, but it's a lot better if you can actually buy a proper barbless hook because there's always a bit of a bump left when you do it um, with the pliers. Um, I think there's an opening for an enterprising person here to probably come up with a range of barbless hooks with some company I'm thinking about it at the moment because it's just a no-brainer. Uh, and, and as I said before, it's, uh, the only reason I've used them for a million years is that's how they come in the packet. Um, and humans being a bit distrusting, I know a lot of people, even when I say this, are going to go, oh, really? You know, is this, is this really going to, am I really going to catch one on this barbless hook? But it's just physics. The hooks, the barb sticks out like that. It's harder to drive it in. We've got a bendy rod. I can tell you, barbless hook is way better. Yeah. And look, it will come to pass. I might be dead before it happens, but eventually... No sports fisherman on the planet is going to be using hook with a barb on it. Yeah. Any more question? Another question? Yep. Uh, probably, probably not. No, probably not really. Um, it's a bit like when you get a splinter in your finger. If you get a splinter in your finger, it's got no barb on it, but it's still bloody hard to pull out. You've got to go and get your missus to get the tweezers and pull it out for you. Uh, and it's a bit like that when you stick a hook in, hook in a bait. Normally the bait's got a bit of skin on it or whatever. Um, no, I don't, I, I don't have a problem with it. Um, I, I can just imagine, let's just dream for a little bit. What, happen, what would happen in Port Phillip Bay if you said, let's make Port Phillip Bay a barbless fishery? How many more snapper would be alive at the end of the year without somebody grabbing hold of a little snapper, qu squeezing the bejesus out of it and wrestling a barbed hook out of it for five minutes when they can just pick it up in the net or whatever, slide a barbless hook out and put it out. You think how many fish get caught in Port Phillip Bay in a year? How many more fish would be alive if it was a barbless fishery? And I can tell you, using bait, when they get it right in their gob, you don't miss one more fish with a, with a barbless hook. Not even one. Another quick question? Yep. Yeah, bad thing. Yes, bad thing. And I, I, that, that photo where I was holding that fish, not a good thing to do. Actually, I've got some other pictures of when I'm holding it properly. Yeah. 
Yes, they should. Yes, they should. And any, well, I suppose it's still it's still debatable. Scientists could probably help me out on this, but a fish is not meant to be out of water for one, because it can't breathe and it's getting sagged around and gravity's pulling on its guts and all the rest of it. So. What we know now is that I think it's much, well, what I suspect is it's much better to have it horizontal if you can. It's better not even take it out of the water. But also, some of the things that, that we've done, you know, with promoting catch and release and stuff, I, I'm like Wayne, I, I look at fishing shows now and probably some of the ones I was involved in, I, all I think about is, for Christ's sake, get the fish back in the water, will you? I mean, you can take it out of the water, we've got the technology to freeze frame it, get it back in the water, still give the customer a bit of a look at what a good fish looks like. But in, an, in another way, what Rexy did, um, it's made a few fish suffer for sure. But my God, he saved a lot of fish's lives in, in, in the world because of that, what he did. Um, there's no doubt about that. I mean, uh, it's not, that's not a, an ideal thing to make a fish suffer and then put it back in the water, I guess. But if it was me, let's just say I'm a fish. Let's anthropomorphise or whatever it is for a little bit. Let's just say I'm a fish and I'm living in Lake Tyres. I'm pretty happy because that... I'm, I'm in Lake Tyres, I've got some good good regulations looking after me and if I'm a big flathead and someone comes and belts the bejesus out of me for a couple of minutes and then holds me out of the water maybe and lets me go and I'm still alive, I'm pretty happy because I've got a good place to live and I, I got hammered around a bit but I'm, I'm still alive. Now let's go back a little bit and say, okay, you shouldn't be letting them go. Where am I then if I get caught? I'm dead, I'm in the frying pan and if I've got a choice, I'm going for the get smacked around a bit and let go, eh? I'm going for that one, that, that's me, if I was a flathead. But yes, we should be doing that and look, a lot of the latest uh, bass technology in America where they're, the large mouth bass where they're always hung them up by the throat and waves them around in front of the crowd and everything and they do, they do let them go but it's pretty well paying lip service to it. But now, most of the really big money tournaments in America, they're taking photos of them on the boat and letting them go and that's how they win. And I've got no doubt in my mind, I mean, I've got no role to play in this, but, and I've fished in a lot of brim tournaments. So far as I'm concerned, there's no way we should be taking them back to the boat ramp and putting them in a glass case to swim around and then letting them go. I've got nothing against um, the tournaments because, I, again, I think in a lot of ways it's, it's doing some good for the actual rest of the fish that are living there because if there's an economic value to those fish being caught in a tournament, maybe they'll be unmolested in that place and used for tourism and used for release and used for that. If I'm a fish, I'm much rather having that. But also I think in a brim tournament, a couple of things I'd do if I was uh, boss of the world, I'd say, okay, you can have your brim tournament, no problem, but by hell, you all better have barbless hooks. I wouldn't be letting them have a brim tournament with a barb on their hook. Why, why would you need to? It's a tournament, you're all against each other, it's all the same rule, even if it was worse, which I don't think it is. Everyone's got to use a barbless hook, bang, pretty easy. And then all the fish that you handle are not going to be squashed, squeezed, whatever. And the other thing I do in a brim tournament is, is say, make another rule and say, OK, boys, you've got, everyone's got a mobile phone, everyone's got whatever. The Yanks can do it. Why can't you do it in Australia? Let's, let's still have our tournament. You can still be a hero. You can get your, win your money. You can have your tourism when everyone turns up and makes the towns work, which is fantastic. But you don't need to be giving them any more of a hard time than possible. Anyway, that's just my, my thoughts. But, yeah, we shouldn't be hanging them up by the throat and that was not the right thing that I did there. Another question, we've got time? Yep. 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 Probably happens. So, uh, look, I, I agree with you. Yeah. Why can't something be done to make them? Well, I'll say it could be done, all right. It's not a drama. I, I'm sure it could be done if someone's got the will to do it. But also, in defence of a lot of those competitions, it doesn't look that great. But in the past, a kid coming up like I was when I started, all I wanted to do was go out there and kill fish and slaughter them, and that was it. There wasn't any of the other. Now, someone aspires to be a, a brim tournament angler, they go out there, they really do have a pretty minimal uh, impact on, on the environment in most cases. Those fish that they're catching when they're practicing and coming to Malakuta and spending their money in the town, they're getting released straight off the bat in the boat and going by what my experience with the aquarium, I know most of those fish are going to live. 
That's better than your other people that are coming to Malakuta and slaughtering the fish hand over fist and at the cleaning table and you, you don't worry about them too much. So those fish are dead as meat. So it's not all doom and gloom with the tournament stuff. I'm not really having a crack at them. I'm just saying I think we could do it better. You know, I, I think it could be done better. And I, I don't think, I'd say probably they just haven't thought about it. Uh, whatever. We've got time? A bit more? Or are we done? Just tell me when we're done and I'll give up. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Even a million years ago, uh, I went and fished one of the first uh, Queensland tournaments, Flathead Classics, up in the Gold Coast. And that's how we did it then, and it was no drama whatsoever. Uh, we just wet the brag mat, made it cool, put the Flathead on it, measured it, wrote it down. And look, someone might cheat, so what? Yeah, it's not the end of the world if someone's cheated in a comp, but all the fish were let go properly. We'll give more chance to ask some more questions after the other presentations. So I'd like everyone to thank uh, Bush. Thanks very much.